okay. And here I am. I'm sitting here in the studio with uh, Chris Wyatt. Most of my listeners know you. And uh, the two of us decided to have a talk on things that is most probably not the run of the mill talks that he usually gets into. But uh, I think it is important points for me to understand properly and to and for you to understand where I come from, Chris. Welcome to Brickmerke and thank you for your time. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I wasn't sure. I came onto your show, I think it was about a month ago, and I thought I heard you say I'd love to have a conversation with you sometime, but I was multitasking and I uh, just want to make sure I did not misunderstand it. But I did hear you say reach out to Vena t- to, uh, to get my contact. And then I realized you must want to chat with me. So I've been so busy with War College Consulting and with election because I'm a judge of elections and also with the veterans organization that um, I decided to wait until after that period of activity slowed down, which just happened. I reached out to you and you said, yes, let's have a conversation. So thank you for the warm welcome. It's my pleasure to be here and hopefully have an interesting conversation. Chris, let me start it off by say I'm going to make a statement and then you can tell me whether I'm on the mark or whether I'm drifting a lot. If you look at the Boer tribe in South Africa and you look at our ancestors, our European ancestors, and you look at a certain section of the American population, would you agree that there is a hell of a lot in common there well i would agree that uh the boer or and that's a very fragmented society boers offer connors uh, you know we can this conversation can go many directions but that tribe as such as you describe it does have very much in common with america and american history we have a similar history with our development with slavery also beyond that we have a similar history with, are you still there Okay. Uh, no, no. I thought I thought I lost you there. <laughs> look, like, look like we had a break in the in the broadcast. No, but so so for instance, the the folks who became the, the Boers and the Alfred Connors um, did not like central government. They didn't like being controlled, and they were independent and they had vision and they were always moving. They believed in faith. They had God. They believed in in the power of of family, and also you know they had a history with firearms and and uh, also farming and such. And they continue to move eastward in your case. And then eventually with the great track went northwards and spread across Southern Africa from there. Whereas in America, our movement was westward. We had the concept of manifest destiny and it was families that went on wagon trains and went out and settled areas for farming primarily. And that's how the country grew. And many of the values that are tied to that with faith, family, firearms, it's a similar situation. So I think that you're onto something. And I've made this argument many times about how South African America's history have very similar trajectories and much in common. You know, Chris, the point that I want to make, and I mean, I, you are very quite familiar with the South African landscape, and uh, and you are aware of the uh, issue between Boer and Afrikaner, and I have I have spoken to one of the guys that wrote a book about the Boer folk. I don't know what folk is in English. It's almost like a nation. People, yeah, people. It's it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's the same word in English. And, and I said to him, "Okay, I read through your book and I agree with a hell of a lot of what you have stated there, but I do not agree with this boor folk boor nation thing. I don't agree with that. My attitude is that we are a tribe. The Seiderlander, Seiderland tribe, not Seidland, Seiderland, Southern African Boer tribe. And in our tribe, we've got obviously of, of a number of clans, but we are part of the larger Boer nation that is spread across the West. And I expected quite a academic reply from him. And to my surprise, He said to me, interesting, let's hear what the people say. And I started talking along those lines about six months ago. And up to today, not a single person has taken me on on my vision of what the Boer actually is. Because if you look 
at the typical South African boo, staying on a farm somewhere in the bush. And you go and you look at the same similar homestead setup in America, in Wyoming or Colorado or Texas, you will find that those two families has got a large number of commonalities and their principles are more or less the same. They are religious people. They're fighting God. It's not negotiable to them and that type of thing. And very important, their integrity. Their integrity is something that they will not, uh, it's not negotiable. Right is right and wrong is wrong and that's it. Do you understand what I'm saying, Chris? 100%. Uh, although I would say when it comes to integrity, unfortunately, that nation has a history of some of its own members selling them, so selling the group out. We've seen that throughout history. But I, I would look at this from a standpoint that I would... Excuse me. Sorry, I got some uh, congestion there. I would look at this from the standpoint, uh, from, this is from the outside looking in. I'm not a South African, of course. But I would look at the, the Afrikaans speaking community. I would start there and work to the Afrikaner community as such and work my way, not down, but into that community. We get to the, the, the Boer or Boer nation. I like your description of clans because what I've always said about this group of people who are primarily in South Africa and Namibia and Botswana, but also spread throughout the Western world, what I've always said about this group of people is the extreme fragmentation in this group and the, the propensity for a lot of people to want to be the leader, which leads to little breakups and kind of like clans, which is what you're saying. I, I think that your description is is pretty apt and, and uh, interesting to hear it, and I wouldn't disagree with it at all. I think that it is it marks that community is this clan sort of or clanish sort of uh, breakup inside. It doesn't mean people don't work together. They don't self-identify as the same sort of group at times, but certainly that's an aspect of it. And yes, people living in the free state uh, on a large farm or somewhere up in the high veld, you know, and let's say in in, um, in what used to be the old Transvaal, uh, you know, where uh, Delaray came from, I mean that part out there. Maybe those folks have very much their life is very much similar to some with a ranch in Wyoming or in South Dakota with uh, cattle or with, with uh, grain production, their belief in faith, their, their, their concept of life, their belief in integrity. Yeah, I agree. It's hundred percent the same. It's very similar. And it's interesting because these two places were settled in that respect by very different people, of course, of European origin, but very different peoples who settled it and have almost the exact same worldview in many respects all the way through to the 21st century. Yes, uh, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm talking along these lines is that that means that many times when I look at people talking in America, prominent people talking in America, you hear a guy and you listen to him and immediately to me, I say to myself, that's a boor. That's a boor. You can hear it from the way he, uh, from his view and the way he tackles his problems and so forth. And you see it in Canada, you see it in Europe a lot. If you look at someone that you will be aware of, you look, uh, for instance, at a guy like Victor Orban. You listen carefully to Victor Orban. That's a boor. That guy is a boor. He stands on his principles. The same with Lavrov from Russia. And you get it, you see it in that fair builders from uh, Netherlands. Netherlands. You hear it. And I listened one night to a guy in Sweden, and he was extremely uh, vocal about the immigrant problem that they have there. And I listened to the guy and I thought to myself, <laughs> that's a boo. <laughs> that's that's why, why he talks like that. And you can hear it. And so, you know, I have this, I have this uh, opinion that it will be the boo tribe or the boo nation across the Western globe that is eventually going to be in the final fight for survival because we're fighting the same thing and this is going to sound odd and i don't want to 
embarrass you or anything, but are you a Christian? Yes, I am. That's that's a matter of record. I've shared that. I don't attend church because I don't need to, to go to a gathering of like-minded people to have a relationship with God. So, But I mean, I, that's, that's open knowledge. I've shared that. Okay. Now, I just wanted to make sure about that because it is my opinion, and if you look in the Bible and you look at Genesis 1, verse 26, 27, 28, and you read that and you think about what you are reading. I am saying that is where the boor was created. Hmm. There. And God endowed the boor with a lot of talents that will make it possible for the boor to survive. And if you look at it, the boor was also endowed with the talent to create. Uh, and if you look at it in practice, you will see they grow food, they tend the animals. Uh, but then you go further because all burras no longer farmers. You see how creative they are in engineering, how creative they are in science and things like that. So the burra has been blessed with a heap of talents specifically to make him survive. Now I'm going to tell, or I want to answer you on your statement about the fragmentation mm -hmm. in the boor, uh, in the boor, let's call it the boor nation. Yeah. Nation that you, you talking, we talk now about the boor nation, but you know we're spread in tribes and clans across the West. Why is it that the boor is such a strong individual? Why is it that the boor doesn't really need people to survive. Why is that? And we discussed that. I discussed it with a friend of mine the other night again. And I said to you, if you look at the reality, what happened during the Anglo-Boer War? The Boer came from their farms all over the Free State and, uh, and uh, Transvaal. Across the fields, they came on on their horses, one two, three, four, and eventually they gather for the battle. And when that battle happens, many times the guy lying behind the rock wouldn't know the guy next to him on his left or his right. But they're shooting in the same direction. And when the fight is over, they get on their horses and they go. Never large collections of men, you know, together and in big uh, brigades and things like that. Always this small commando type of thing. That's where the concept of uh, guerrilla warfare came from. Why is that? It is because that Boer has got this strong individuality. But God knew, and he knew when he made the Boer, that if the Boer is a pack animal, the, enema, the, the enemy will wipe him out. All they need to do is just get them all into a corner and wipe them out. But because the boor is this lone wolf type of guy, if you want to start, if you want to start uh, wiping out the boor tribe and the boor nation, you have to hunt for each one of them individually, <laughs> because you're not going to catch them all in one place. Does that make sense to you, Chris? It does make sense to me. A few points on that, but let me go back to your previous comment and, and, and mention that um, it's interesting and very generous that you consider folks like Victor Orban and Chet Filders and maybe even Nigel Farage and maybe possibly as, as part of the larger Boer nation. Uh, I find that interesting. Uh, for me personally, a lot of people call me a Boer, but uh, I'm not South African. And the reason I make that point is that when I first started doing my broadcast that I'm doing now after retiring from active military service in early 2020, a friend of mine who's an Afrikaans musical performer, Giselle, is from, um, she's from, is it Hoodfontein up in uh, Namibia, up there in the north. And um, she grew up on a farm. She's an Afrikaans speaker. And I was trying to introduce her music to people, and I described her as a Bornemisi. And, and all these people, she's not a Bornemisi. She's not a Bornemisi. No, she's not from South Africa. I'm like, 
see a half thief from South Africa to be a born I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me. And that's that's one of the times it became pretty obvious. I dealt with the fragmentation of that community for a long time, but this was just so obvious. I'm like, come on, let go. This, 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 the, the woman is a born I see. <laughs> She's just through and through. Yeah. yeah, I mean, give me a break. But you know, in my case, I grew up in all kinds of circumstances in America. But my formative years as a teenager in high school. I was a dairy farmer in a poor region of America known as Appalachia. You've probably heard of it. And, and I grew up with a concept that the Boers grow up with, self-reliance, individualism, responsibility, and a yeah. drive to do things. Now, in, in North America, we've had this concept uh, that's kind of lost, uh, not lost favor, but doesn't get talked about much anymore because the woke crowd calls it racist, but the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic, WASP. And that is something that I grew up with. And, and that sort of sticks with me. But when we talk about the Boer and what you're talking about, and I understand where you're coming from this, really it comes down to the concept of individualism, but but you don't ignore the bigger community, the family and the no. wider, no. But in, but but we, we recognize the individual and we respect the individual and we hail the individual. Uh, but it comes down to something that, um, and I'll do my best to pronounce the Afri Afrikaans correctly, but in English we say self-reliance and in Afrikaans I believe you would say self posture uh, it's yeah. the same the same sort of thing. And that's really what it comes down to. And there's another similarity here. You talk about the commando system. We had a system similar, but not identical to what the commando system was. And our system was the system of local militia, Minutemen, who on a minute's yeah. notice would grab their powder, grab their horn, grab their wadding, grab their musket, and get their saddle, jump on their horse. Now, in this case, many of the folks knew each other because they were from communities that weren't as widespread as the Boer communities were in what is South Africa. Our communities are much closer because the soil was the soil was very fertile, and we were still fighting a lot of Indians back then, even when we fought the British off. So that was a similar concept, and that developed responsibility, rugged responsibility. You, you have to be prepared for a calamity at any given time. And I think, yeah. in that respect, the board community and and Americans share a very similar trait in our early history that kind of played out over time. Yes. Uh, all right. Now let's talk about. What is currently going on? I want to talk about what's currently going on. Oh, in let, me, let me interrupt you for just a second because I, I forgot one point. I'm sorry. I apologize. You know, you talk about how you're going to have to hunt the border down one by one if you want to eliminate them. It reminds me of Estonia. After the Soviets reconquered Estonia, they took it over from after the Wehrmacht was chased out of there in the late 1940s. The Forest Brothers were active in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And it wasn't until 1978 that the KGB finally got the last of the hunted, wanted uh, Forest Brothers. Now, these were guys who sabotaged Soviet military facilities and, and undermined Soviet um, collectivization efforts in those Baltic states. And if you've been to them, there's not a lot of places to really, really super hide. It's not like hiding you know, in, in, in uh, Canada in the forest. So August Saba was the last of them in 1978, and he wasn't taken alive. Two KGB agents approached him on a creek when he was fishing with a line, and he realized there were KGB agents. They went to snag him, and he jumped in the river and uh, apparently got his boot caught into a, a branch and drowned. But 1978, that is rugged determinism. That is rugged individualism. That is rugged struggle. And that's an example of hunting down the last of the boars. They got the last of the Forest Brothers. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that story. No, that is, uh, that is very applicable because that part of the world there, the uh, – yeah, the western the, part yeah. of the European continent, apparently from the information that I have, that was where the original Boer concentration was on Atlantis. And from there they spread into Europe and then they went eastwards, eastwards, down the Caucasus and even down into Iran. If you look at Iran today, Iran is not Arabs. That's where most no. Western people make a mistake. No, they're they Persian. See the Iranians as Arabs. The Iranians are not Arabs. No, they're Persian. And, uh, so, but let's get back to today. Back to the USA. USA, yep. Yeah. If I sit here and I look at what's playing out there, for me, the main struggle is good values versus liberalism this everything goes type of shit and what i don't understand is that the and i'm going to call them for discussion purposes the good people why are they taking so much shit from the liberals that's a good question first off let me, let me clarify something from my perspective so the term liberal in itself isn't a bad thing it's been corrupted 
So for instance, liberalism in here, the concept of liberalism would be belief in freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Those are liberal ideas. And I think that we would agree that we share those ideas on the conservative side of the spectrum. But the problem is that liberalism has been perverted by American political system to which liberals now really are deep leftist people who are woke and out out of the norm. And there are very few classical liberals left in American political society, at least on the Democratic side of the political ticket. And so you get this 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 confusion and mixing and the destruction of a name. It's kind of like, you know, for instance, the uh, the Confederate battle flag, Confederate flag, the flag that people call Confederate flag is not the Confederate flag. The stars and bars was the flag of uh, the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, which was one element of a country that tried to break away from the United States under Robert E. Lee for much of its history. That's what that flag is. That was never the Confederate flag. And just like the swastika, the swastika is associated with the Nazis, but they didn't create it. It comes from Denmark and India. That's where it was used prior to that. It was a sign of fertility, good luck, good harvest, that sort of thing. But the the Nazis appropriated, now it's, it's forever tainted, and the Confederate flag is forever tainted. So liberalism, I think, might also be forever tainted by the actions of lunatical politicians in the West. But why do people take it? Well, here's the bottom line. Because the stuff doesn't touch most people on a daily basis. Also, to take the South African analogy that people are always talking about, which is not really South African, but it's it's best known in that context today, the frog in the pot. You don't know you're boiling until you're fried, right? You know, Sir Ramaphosa said that. He just stole that from someone else. But that's what's happening. America, we're the frogs in the pot. The water's got a little bit warmer. Oh, it's no big deal. You know, we can live with it. Next thing you know, it's scalding. Before we realize it. what is happening in America started in the 1960s, the destruction, the moral decay, the erosion of our values, the, the subterfuge, the undermining of our electoral system, the invasion of our country started back then. And it was a slow, slow roll. The lunatic scumbags with their hippie hair and their drug use and their free sex in the 60s became college professors in the 1980s and 1990s. Yeah. And they also became and their offspring who were raised like idiots became the high school and primary school teachers of the 90s, the 2000s, and today. And as a consequence, we have a society that is rotten from the inside, moral decay, yeah. and that is the problem. And the problem is that most people are comfortable in their existence. Not everybody. Some, many, a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people are suffering. But most people are comfortable in their existence. They're happy with what they have. They're not starving. They have a car. They have television. They can meet. They can pay their bills pretty much. And, you know, they can enjoy their time, watch their sports. And so I think they're just narcotized to the catastrophe going on around them. For instance, I just ran for state legislature. And instead of picking the best candidate, I would argue I'm the best candidate. But even if I'm not the best candidate, there was at least one other candidate that was very good. Instead of picking the best candidate, they picked a stooge who will do what they want them to do for political reasons, instead of going with the person that will stand by the principles. This person has no principles. And every time we went to a discussion where we spoke in public, he would change his persona. It was like Kamala Harris, you know, which accent do I use this time? And that's where we're at. People pick that. Now, this guy won because he was a high school teacher for 25 years here. And he's popular because he didn't take on the hard kids. He got the advanced placement. All the kids want to go to university. So he never had any problem children. So people love them. They've gone to school. They've graduated. Now they're voters and their parents are still voters. And so he won the election by a couple hundred votes out of five candidates for that reason alone, not to mention the corrupt things the Republican Party did. So my point with this is that is that we live in a society where most people don't stand up for what's right, moral and just. And you must do that all the time. When I came back to South Africa after the COVID scam, my first trip back to South Africa in 2022, I spoke at the Reformation Society in Rondebosch. And the topic is, you know, standing up for what's right, moral and just, regardless of the challenges, which is something I've had to face in my life. You do the right thing all the time, not when it's convenient. Yes. Thank you. I think you have explained the situation and I'm going to go back to my word. Decent people in South Africa in Germany, in France, in anywhere in the West. Decent people has got exactly the same problem. The destruction of the family was the first mission. Now, I talk a lot about Triple X, and I'm going to give you a link to a, uh, to a video that I published on Rumble because YouTube would kill me if I place it on YouTube. <laughs> I'll give you a link to that, and you can listen to it where I explain what Triple X is. And 
it is it consists out of the three X's, obviously, where the first X is the Rothschilds and the Kazarians and the Freemasons and the religious leg and the banking leg. The center X is Klaus Schwab's gang. They are the guys that this first X has got first the financial control and money power with which they corrupt everything. Plus the religion, the religious people are with them there. That's where the religious fight is run in that first X. The second X, they are the guys that are the industry controllers. They are the guys that are the government and political controllers. That's what they represent, basically. And then the last X is the globalists, the stuff like BlackRock and all those guys. Now, those three together has got one mission. That is to make as much money as possible and to have as much power as possible and fuck the people. That is how they operate. Now, if you look at the struggle that we have in South Africa as Buddha, and you look at how the people are struggling in Europe, and you see what's happening in America, I have this slogan that I use a lot, which I say, for survival, go tribal. Hmm. Because it is only the tribes that can really break triple X. No political system will ever be able to break triple X because the political systems is an instrument of triple X, where if you go tribal and your tribal council sits and they say, okay, these guys that are mining on our land, our tribal land, either they pay a fair price or they get out. And if they walk in there with a contract, the tribal council throws a contract in the fire and say that thing has got no bearing in here. Yeah, tribal law counts and none of that. Your only option is pay a fair price or get out. And that is how, why I am saying the tribes is the only ones that will survive. Now, if you look at what happened in uh, Russia over the last two and a half years, the Russian government has come out very strongly on family values. And they said, and they got rid of this alphabet gangsters and all of those NGOs with their liberal shit. They, those guys are not allowed there because the Russians focus on the core family. And you see the same happening in uh, Hungary now. They are also pushing strong in that direction. In Hungary, if I remember correctly, if you have four children, if a woman has four children, She's exempted from tax for the rest of her life. She never pays tax again. Things like that. And the European Union, especially that EU Politburo sitting in Brussels, they are fighting the people like Orban like hell because he is for them a threat. And uh, now in America, this triple X puppets, has got basically all the political power in their hands. And they do what they like. I mean, how is it possible for a decent thinking man, a rational thinking man, to understand that the people in North Dakota is drowning in their rivers and there's not money to assist them, but at the same time they send billions to the Ukraine and to Israel? How, how does that make sense? Because it's actually the people's money that are being sent out. And the same for, if I look at the videos that I see of your veterans sleeping on the streets, sleeping in gutters, sleeping in stormwater drains, sleeping under bridges, where I listened to one guy, I can't remember his name, and he said how many million dollars it would take to give every veteran a decent home. But, and it's a fraction of what they are uh, uh, sending to the Ukraine. And I ask myself, how is it possible that the nation, the American nation, why are they taking that? Why are they absorbing that? 
Because if you look at the boor in South Africa, we don't have the numbers. We are outranked here by 96%. So you can understand that we have the struggle that we have because we're a small minority. But if you look at America, you guys have got the numbers there. Say 40% of your American nation is Buddha. 40%. That is 120 million, isn't it? Yeah, about that, yep. Now, if 40% of the Buddha in South Africa wants to get up and fight, how many, how many are we? 500,000? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> you see, this is, the, this is the difference. So I'm waiting. I am of the opinion, Chris. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm of the opinion. If Kamala Harris wins this coming election, America is going to erupt in civil war. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, definitely it's game over. America is truly on the precipice of a disaster. This is the dumbest box of rocks I've ever seen in my life. I mean, the woman is, I've seen third graders can articulate American history better than this clown. She is is complete moron, the dumbest, dumbest, stupidest idiot I've ever seen. And, and that's topping Joe Biden, which is pretty impressive. Joe Biden has been wrong about every single thing throughout his entire career and spent 60 years nearly in government. It's amazing how stupid voters can be. You know, I think the country is really on the edge here. And um, as far as um, a few of those, let me, let me address the veteran thing real quick. Hang on. Sorry. So the thing about veterans, you have to be very careful on this one, Colleen, is, is that is that um, a lot of people who purport to be veterans and are interviewed and you find a video aren't actually veterans. They do that. They claim that because it's stolen valor so that people have empathy for them. That said, there are veterans that are homeless on the street, but almost in every case, it's a consequence of mental illness or PTSD. And oftentimes people, as a consequence of those illnesses, refuse to get treatment or refuse to get help. But the United States government does have a program. We'll talk about the billions they waste elsewhere. But there is a program through the Veterans Administration that any any veteran, and you don't have to be the veteran. You can be somebody that I, I see a guy on the street every day. He's a veteran. You can call in. There is a toll-free number 24 hours a day manned by the Veterans Administration that if you identify a veteran that's homeless, the VA will get them in housing that day. Now, oftentimes that means that they put them in a hotel for a day or two or maybe a week or so while they find accommodation for them. And that program is free of charge to any veteran. Now, the caveat is that that's only for one year. You have to sort yourself out, get care, get treatment, you know, find a job. They'll help you do all those things. But you have one year, they'll take care of housing, and then you have to find your own housing. So in theory, there's there's no excuse or no reason for any U.S. veteran to be on the street. Uh, so, But there are. I mean, I'm not going to – I can't deny that. There are veterans on the street. But – we, we, they have a program for that. So that's important for people to understand because that comes up an awful lot. But a lot of videos people put online, a lot of the news that's reported are dishonest because they never tell you that side of it. You'll see that I just admitted that there are homeless veterans on the street, okay. but there's a reason for it. But but they don't tell you that there's they don't have to be. If I don't have a home, if I lose my home, I can call the Veterans Administration and they'll put me up and I've got a year to sort myself out. So and it doesn't matter where you live in the country. They'll do it everywhere. It's Wyoming in the middle of nowhere or it's back here, you know, in Pennsylvania. Good. Uh when we're talking about what, what you have said now about the veterans, about two days ago, one night in one of my Burbiscate lives, I addressed the issue about the white squatters. And I made some statements that obviously got some people jumping. But the reality is this. The vast majority of those squatters, they like it to be there. You go and you offer them a job. They're not interested in a job. They want money so they can buy booze or something with it. They're not interested in getting out of the rut. And there are people there that life gave them a whacker and they landed there. But those are the people, the first opportunity they get to get out, they take that opportunity and they're out. So I understand exactly what you are saying about the veterans, that they, they, they're on the street because they want to be on the street. They don't well, they, need to be there. Agreed. But th there are cases, for instance, we had a soldier who just got out of the army and went through a divorce and, uh, you know, child support and things like that. And at the end, because the, the court ordered it, but it wasn't here, didn't have enough money to live off of. So didn't have a home. And 
<clears throat> the person wasn't even a member of our veterans organization. Someone brought it to our attention. And so we referred them and made the call to the VA to get that person housing. That person had just come out of Korea and only served in the army for like two years, but nonetheless is a veteran. And so uh, they, the VA got that person in a hotel and eventually uh, within a week or two got them a place that was subsidized uh, where that person could stay in a safe neighborhood. So, yeah, no, but uh, but I agree 100 percent. It is that way. You, you offer people jobs. They don't want it. They just want handouts. They want they don't they don't want to earn their way in life. But there are some people that find themselves in unfortunate circumstances that will grab themselves by the bootstraps and lift themselves up. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's kind of that. What was the rest that we were talking about? I got a little bit off track because I wanted to about the veterans. I apologize. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's not off track. These are the things that I feel is important for my viewers to understand. And the thing that is important for me to the message that I want to bring over is that there's a hell of a lot of correlation once you go right down to the basement of people among what the Buddha sees as their culture and characteristics and what a lot of Americans see as their culture and characteristics. And can you imagine, Chris, just think for a moment, the prime fighters from the Boer tribe in South Africa and the prime warriors from the American Boer tribe. And you put those fighters together, who will stop them? Well, you make a good point. You know, it's interesting because uh, if you look at all the actions of the ANC and the government since 1994, so much of their energy has been devoted to their terror and their fear of the Boer nation. They're absolutely bat crap crazy terrified of the Boer. I mean, they even invent things. And you had the Boer Mog and, and more government spies were part of Boer Mog than actual Boer Mog members. So so they, yeah. they devoted endless amounts of intelligence effort into that, yet they pay little attention to real threats like terror financing that goes through the financial system of South Africa and people supporting terror groups around the world. But they put their energy into the Boer Mog. Um, and, you know, people against gangsterism and drugs was um, – a uh, street organization that was organized, but eventually turned to terror, and they paid very little attention to it until after the uh, Planet Hollywood was bombed in Cape Town, and suddenly, because of international pressure, they paid attention. When the ANC wants to, it can galvanize its resources to go after things it fears as a threat, and it spent a lot of its time devoted to going after... Now, Pug Out had nothing to do with the Boer Nation. I'm just giving an example, but uh, they, they go after, and they put in place all these racist laws, which are meant to undermine your opportunities to form businesses, they put in things that force you to hire people or give your equity to people based on skin pigmentation to undermine the Boer nation. It is, it is seriously their fear. And they've dumped down education standards to pretend that people are educated when they're not uh, so that they can fill government jobs and take those jobs away from people who are competent, many of whom are in the Boer nation. On my trip to South Africa in 2000, I met a, a lovely lady who had been a primary school teacher for years, very successful in the Western Cape. She lived in Stellenbosch. And she started a small business called Toy Marai. Her ancestors were German and became Afrikaners and Boers. So I was in this little knickknack souvenir shop, knickknack souvenir shop in Stellenbosch in 2000. I walked in and I saw the name was German. So I took a chance and started speaking German. And she spoke German. <laughs> she was a fourth generation South African. And one of her grandparents was Röntgen, the guy that discovered the x-ray. Anyway, so it, the story is I was talking to her and we started talking in German for a bit and it, I asked her why she started the shop because it was lovely. She said, well, I didn't have a choice. I said, what do you mean? Well, I was pushed out of my job teaching. Uh, and so she was pushed out because she was white off her con speaking. And my point here is that the ANC government sees Boer and Alfred Connor as a threat at every angle. They pretend that they're not, but their actions speak louder than the words. In America, the forces of the left see average everyday Americans who believe in God and guns <laughs> and are self-reliant and believe in America as a unique nation, that city on the hill, the city, the, the shining city on the hill, they view them as a threat to their efforts to create the world in their view, which is how they profit and how they become wealthy. For their, And there's three things I talk about. And I use this in my political campaign and I've never heard anyone else use it. So I'll, I'll take credit for it because I thought of it. And I talk about this is the crowd that are interested only in craving political power self-interest and self-aggrandizement that's what it's all about that is what yeah. it's all about if you, if you look at the world through that lens you understand what they're doing and in south africa they've undermined the value of the family of education of self-reliance by making people dependent on the state and not giving them even enough to survive off of just enough to be starving to be hungry waiting for some great and wonderful politician to give them the next handout 
In America, we've done the same thing. In 1970, only 8% of total income came from government grants to Americans, 8%. And that was mostly Medicare for medical payments for the elderly and Social Security. But Social Security is supposedly a retirement system, but it's not. So 8%. Today, 18% of total income that goes into the hands of American citizens is a government handout. 18%. That's insane. Yes. That's insane. Well, it, it, uh, it's like here in South Africa. Around about 7 million taxpayers are paying for 21 million people on grants. Well, but it's worse it than that, it's worse than that, Colleen, because that's who receive the grants. But those grants support larger numbers. And so well over half the South African population lives off of grants. We're talking yes, yes. over 43 million people living off of grants. That, it's not sustainable. It is no, not, it's not sustainable. Well, you see it in the midterm budget that just came out. The, the budget deficit for even their, 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 their not particularly ambitious budget is 22 billion rand short, but it's even worse than that because they want to give 11 billion rand to get people to leave government. from gov So that's really a 33 billion rand deficit. And this is before they ever give any handouts to the state of enterprise like South African Airways or ESCOM or Transnet. Now, uh, Gondwana said there'll be no handouts, but we know that's not going to be true. As the year progresses, they'll give money to ESCOM or somebody like that because they always do it. So things are truly truly in the crapper in South Africa. Your national debt in 2015, I think it was, was 676 billion rand. That's a lot, but not so much as a share of GDP. Today, it's nearly 7 trillion rand, 10 years later. 7 trillion rand. It's 10 times as large your debt. Ours has grown a lot, but not by that percentage. South Africa is in real trouble here. No wonder they're desperate for money from Iran and from China. You know, uh, the thing is this. If you look at well, I did a skid mark that I have published, and then I did one, which is in English, on this uh, story of the DA, Minister of Home Affairs, and his visums to the uh, Ukrainians. And uh, if you look at what they are doing with the money, it makes absolutely no sense. It makes no fucking sense. You can go any way you like about it. It doesn't make sense. And then I listened to, uh, to that minister last night, and he's barely flippant about the shortfall. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, if you look at the reality that every rand they get in 75 cents is debt that they have to service, and at a stage, <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to be able to make it. I know it. And it, it, you just need to be an a, a average common sense businessman to understand that kite is not going to fly. No, can't, you're not going to get left. We've got the same problem. We were now paying $1 trillion a year in interest payments on our debt. That was just $240 billion five or six years ago. So it's five times as bad now. And, and yeah. when you look at our actual debt that's out there for the federal, this is just the federal government's debt, not, not state, county, municipal debt, you know, consumer debt, mortgage debt. This is just federal government debt. When you look at that debt, most of that debt was issued at less than 1% interest rates. So you can imagine how much debt that is that we're paying a trillion dollars in interest at less than 1%. Imagine if it was at today's rates, which are four and a half, five percent 5% for debt. The, the, the dollar would just collapse and the world economy collapse. Uh, we need adults in the room, and we don't have them in America or in South Africa. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, in South Africa, the government is run by the dumbest people in the nation. <laughs> the dumbest people in the nation. Yeah. And I listened last night to uh, short clips that someone put together about Kamala Harris, a few of her interviews. And I listened to this stuff, and I thought to myself, how the fuck is it possible that a dumb rock like that can run to be the president of America, which is viewed as the leader of the West. I mean, what the hell went wrong, Chris? What went wrong? Education. That's what went wrong. So you know, I fight, can't... Uh, the fight, the fight yeah. to destroy education started around about the middle 80s. And they are winning that fight. They're winning okay, that they, fight. They, they, they've, they've won the fight. We're fighting a rear guard action to, to, to limit the damage at this point. 
it's like, you know, we're, we're at Colenso. We've won the victory. We, we leave the battlefield. We go back to our farms. But on the way, a British regiment comes from the uh, from an oblique angle, and we have to fight a rear guard action so everybody can get away safely. That's what's happening in education in America. Education is gone. It's completely destroyed. So here's yeah. an example. I came back from Tunisia after 9-11. I was stationed in Tunisia. I came back. To the states, I have an army jacket that has army on the back. It's a rain jacket, it's just commercial one. It's not from the army. So I was at a restaurant, and people were talking about uh, the election. This is a year after the 2000 election with George Bush and uh, Al Gore and hanging chads and Florida and all that nonsense. And and all these people are talking about it like uh, they're like Bush stole the election. I said no, he didn't. Well, the Supreme Court gave the election. I said no, they didn't. That's not what happened. And I was surprised. It. And then I I had a conversation with my sister. I'm the eldest. And she lives in Arizona and she claims to be a Republican. She's not. But anyway, she, she's talking about how Bush stole the election. Like, I didn't steal the election. And I said, well, she started talking about the Electoral College is wrong and all that. And I said, well, we, we talking. I said, well, didn't you learn that in civics? She, she said, I didn't have civics. And she was three years behind me. I'm the eldest. And then my, so she didn't have civics, which we normally teach our system of governance in seventh and eighth grade. So after primary yeah. school, before you go into high school. And then in high school, so I was required to take that in junior high school. I was also required to take American government before I graduated from high school. My sister behind me wasn't required to take civics. They got rid of that in the mid 80s. Mm, funny, the time correlation you're talking about here. And then my brother, a year behind her, wasn't required to take American government by the time he got to high school. They had taken government out as a required course. So we have generations of Americans who are functionally illiterate when it comes to our governance and our political system. It's the same thing in South Africa. I don't know what they're teaching in schools, but they clearly don't teach your system of governance. Here, people don't even understand the purpose of the Electoral College. When South Africans are curious about our system of government and they ask me, I give them all the respect in the world because Americans don't even know the system. So well, how can I expect South Africans to know it? Although some do. It is really disheartening to hear the nonsense going on and the way that people behave. And I'm about to do a video. I'm going to write an article for um, the IR probably or whoever will publish it about what is happening right now in America. The mainstream media are lying about election related issues that are taking place right now. And right here in the county I live in, I've seen it firsthand. Now, they, they're claiming that Trump is overstating, that people are conspiracy theorists, that this isn't happening, that isn't happening. But these things are happening. They're actually happening. It's not conspiracy theory. We have the district attorney for Lancaster County doing press conferences, telling people that they've got fraudulent applications. And then the New York Times says that's not happening. We have people turned away from early voting. And the and the Washington Post says there is no early voting in Pennsylvania. That's a complete lie. It's not called early voting. It's called in-person voting. But it's the same thing. You go before the election. You stand in line. You fill out a form, a mail-in ballot, and you can give it to them. That's early voting. You get to vote before the election. But this it's insane what's going on here. And people drink the Kool-Aid, Colin. They drink the Kool-Aid. They believe this nonsense because they have no education, because they're dumb as a box of rocks. Quite frankly, I don't want to sound arrogant, but we used to have literacy tests for people to actually get to vote. You know, we might need a competency test for people to vote because people are stupid beyond belief. And that's how this happens. It all gets tied up into no education and pop culture. People are influenced by pop culture, and that's how they think the world works. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's kind of akin to me going to Nigeria or Ghana and people thinking that Arnold Schwarzenegger is America, that, that what happens in the movies is America. It's not. That's Hollywood. And what's happening in our political scene, the truth is buried by the powers that you've talked about, that triple X, who don't want people to see through the veil. And it works. And it's a constant struggle. I have never said anything outlandish. I've never made any outrageous conspiracy theories. I've never made any fraudulent claims. My record of predictions is pretty darn good in 30 plus years as an intelligence analyst and officer and also as a private consultant. Yet my content is hidden by YouTube. Why? Because they yeah. can't impeach my, they cannot impeach my bona fides. I got people on the left lying about people. I mean, I got people on the right lying about me, calling me a CIA agent. I got people on the left calling me a white nationalist, a white supremacist. All this stuff. And then YouTube censoring my channel, taking it away for 23 months when I did nothing wrong because they're terrified of people who speak the truth, who are honest about the truth and have no agenda. My only agenda is protecting liberty and ensuring a safe environment for people around the world. That's my only agenda. If I become well known because of that, so what? That's not what it's about. I've been famous before. I don't care about being famous. It's about doing the right thing, doing what's right, moral and just every time. And that, that's my agenda. So there you go. You know, Chris, I listen to you when you talk. And you talk, you talk a language that my heart understands, because I understand where you come from. And we've got the same roots. And 
what you say is it goes about what is right and what is wrong. Now, if you look at how old are you? I will be turning uh, 60 on Christmas Day. <laughs> okay, I, can, I cannot believe I'm going to be 60 years old. I feel like I'm 35. Okay. I am approaching 73. Oh, my goodness. You carry it very well. I wouldn't have said 73. <laughs> You're welcome. But, but now, if I think back to the 60s, mm-hmm. 50s, 60s, brilliant minds in America made a big difference to the lives of people because of what they invented and what they created. And that carried on in the 60s, it was still there. In the 70s, it was still there. And then in the 80s, it started going down. And I listened to many of these guys talking about the battle between America and China and so forth. And I asked myself, do these people actually understand what the fuck they are talking about? (laughs) If you go and you look at the Chinese education system, I mean, the grade twos are doing mathematics and science which in our country, they don't even have to do to get a matric. Mm-hmm. And you look at the discipline in those Chinese schools. I mean, those go- and the same with the Japanese. Mm-hmm. The same with the Russians. Those children are so disciplined and focused on education. And that is all they get. I mean, Putin pulled the Russian curriculum away from the EU influence it had this year. They have re- they've reverted back to their traditional curriculum because he said that that EU curriculum is not preparing kids to face life. No. They, they, they don't do it. Now you look at that, that one video I had, uh, I saw about that one uh, Chinese school I mean, Chris, those kids, I look at them and I, and I think, well, they're about six, maybe seven years old. They cook their own lunch. They serve their lunch to their classmates. Then they all clean the, the area. They clean the kitchen. Then they have to go and sleep for an hour in their seats. That seat tilts back and they sleep. Then they continue with this. And then before they can go home, all those kids in that school clean the school. They sweep the hallways. They sweep the floors. They, sweep, they, they clean the place. Then they go home. And I spoke to a guy that lives in China and he said to me, he's got three kids. He said to me, my kids, they nag us in the morning to hurry up, hurry up. They want to get to school. Mm-hmm. And I think to myself, okay, now the Americans are fighting the Chinese. Do they really understand what the fuck they're fighting? <laughs> if, you look, if you look at China, they produce per year more engineers and scientists than the rest of the world together. Correct. And then the people come and they say, yeah, but those Chinese, the moment that he's out of his university and he's got his degree... He goes to the West because he wants out of China. The other night I listened to a Chinese lady and she was talking about it and she addressed that point specifically. She says, what the people do not understand is we encourage our graduates to go to the West. They are, our people are well educated and they are a good contributor to wherever they go in the West. But they also learn what the West is doing. And how the West is doing things. And then they see <laughs> And she said, most of those Chinese students, graduates that goes away, 10 to 12 years, and they come back to China with all their experience. Yeah, I've been watching this since the 1980s. In fact, uh, our universities have hundreds of thousands of Chinese who come here. And that's exactly what they do. They participate in our system. They learn from it. They Some of them stay. Many of them go back. And uh, a lot of them are spies. And that's why espionage goes on. Not all, but many of them are. 
So it really benefits them. But you know, let me tell you a quick story here. Um, so when it comes to education, this is just how bad things get. So my father, who has since passed, uh, graduated uh, high school, I think around 1952, because he's born in 34. Uh, I graduated high school in 1982, so three decades later. One time I was having a conversation with my father about foreign language because he told people I speak Russian. I said, no, no, he thought someone told him. I said, no, I speak languages, but I don't know any Russian at all other than yet. That's all I know. Or, anyway, so we were talking and uh, about language in school. And I said, well, did you take foreign language in school? Because when I was in high school, I took Latin. It was optional. I took one year and I was terrible at it. <laughs> I remember almost nothing from it. But so so my father, we were talking about school. And, I, and, and when he went to high school, he said, yeah, I had to take uh, I had to take um, Greek and Latin and a foreign language. And I paused for a moment and said, Greek and Latin and a foreign language aren't Greek and Latin foreign languages. He goes, no, those are classical languages. Everybody in high school had to study Greek and Latin and also take a foreign language. So he studied, I think, French. I'm like, wow, I didn't even have to take a foreign language. And I said, what did you have to take for math? And he said, well, I had to take algebra, trigonometry, geometry in order to graduate high school. I'm like, all I had to have was one year of basic math. I didn't even have to have algebra to graduate high school. I said, what about English? Did you have to have English the whole time? He said, yeah, I had, had English all four years of high school. I said, I was only required to take English for two years. I took it for four, uh, but I was only required to take it for two years. This is already the denigration and the degradation of our education system in just one generation. From the 1950s, where students had haircuts and they wore proper clothing and they went to school and they had discipline, they had a curriculum. That's a public school my father went to, not a private school, no, not, not something special. I also went to public schools. And look at the difference in the requirements for him and then for me. And it's only gotten worse. And it's just absolutely crazy. It's back crap crazy how much they've undermined our education system. And when people are not literate, when they lack critical thinking skills, and that's what I try to push for. I talk, I try to tell people, think critically, not be critical. You can be critical, you know, but Kamala Harris is dumb as a box of rocks. That's being critical. But thinking critically, analyzing her lack of policy positions and the idiotic ideas of giving 25000 grant to first-time home buyers, not realizing the inflationary pressure that will put on houses and the moral bankruptcy of giving money to homeowners finance or to new homeowners financed by existing homeowners who've already paid for their own houses or paying for the houses without any assistance. And then on top of that, this million dollar grant, to, it, it's a loan, but it'll be a forgiven grant to black men, which is unconstitutional. And, and that's actually thinking critically, analyzing what's going on. The problem is that we lack, we have a dearth of critical thinkers in the West. And that is why we have a political situation we have in America and why people still vote for the ANC in South Africa. Nobody in their right mind regardless of whether you're in the struggle or you help liberate South Africa, whatever it is you claim, nobody in the right mind would vote for the ANC. It's a kleptocratic, race-based, no longer multiracial organization that is all about the caters eating all they can. It's our turn to eat. That's what the ANC is all about. Nobody in their right mind would vote for that unless they profit from it. Anyone else that votes for them is just plain stupid. Ah, I said it. If I get hate mail, I'll take it. <laughs> no, you, you are... You are 100% right, Chris. It is uh, the degradation of good values that has been pushed slowly but surely into the schools mm -hmm. and made the kids lazier and lazier and lazier. And entitled, entitled. Yeah. They, you owe me this. You owe me that. I Give me that. Give me. No, no. You earn your way in life. Nobody gets handed anything. This is the problem. They, you know, it is it is a typical thing in in business of risk and reward, and they don't understand that base principle that you have to put effort in if you want results for yourself. If you are granted stuff, you must understand the first problem is you have not earned it. So you are actually not entitled to it. And life will take it away from you like that because you got it for free. You did not earn it. And I look at what they're doing to the schools. This weekend, a video was running about a school in the Western Cape where the community is plundering the school. And I look at it and I think to myself, what the hell is that? How is it possible that the community allows that to happen? If I think back at my childhood, if I would have dared 
to damage something at school, apart from the fact that the teacher would whip the blood out of me, when I get home, my dad will skin me basically alive for doing something stupid like that. And yet today, they don't see a problem with school children wrecking school assets. We must be tolerant. And where is that tolerance <laughs> going to end? Where is that tolerance going to end? Complete destruction. I mean, just look at Colin. Just look at look at um, the streets of Salisbury, Harare today. Look at photographs of Salisbury in the 1970s still, and how clean and well kept and prosperous it was. And black and white Zimbabweans walking or Rhodesians walking down the street, behaving themselves. And look at photographs of it today. You can do the same thing with Josie. Look at jo jo Johannesburg. I mean, you look at the photographs. Someone's created a Twitter account, which is amazing. It takes Google Earth pictures, not even from the 70s, but from just a decade ago, and showing the, the destruction of the city of Johannesburg in just the last 10 years. But if we went back and looked at what Johannesburg looked like in the 70s, it was a gleaming metropolis. Hillbrow was not the dangerous neighborhood that it is now. It wasn't run down. And the list goes on and on. This comes from sloth. This comes from irresponsibility. This comes from spoiling the rod or sparing the rod and spoiling the child in society. That's what society's done. We've we've spared the rod and spoiled the child of society all over the world, especially in the developed West. Now, not everywhere. I mean, look at Malaysia. Malaysia is a clean town, a clean country. Uh, Singapore is a clean city. South Korea is, a, you know, th these are people who are industrious, who respect the family and build on the family and respect education. And look how they're prospering. Look how they're prospering. America's living off of what we were, not what we are. Yeah, we are, not, we are not great. We were great. We were great. That doesn't yes. mean we didn't have we didn't have problems. Every country has problems and warts, but we're living off of that. We're living off of the excess that we accrued. But that accrual of goodwill and resources and wealth and and and, and cultural hegemony is dissipating every day. It's like a balloon, and the air is coming out every day. And America is on a path to collapse. And the only way I can stop it is start taking responsibility and stop sparing the child or spoil. I keep getting it wrong. Stop spoiling the child by sparing the rod. It's time for discipline and for responsibility. Personal responsibility is non-existent in this country. Non-existent. Eric Swalwell, a member of Congress, slept with a Chinese spy, not even censured by Congress for doing that. He's a serving member of Congress sleeping with a Chinese spy. Barbara Boxer had a Chinese spy who was her driver. No consequences for her. The governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, had a Chinese spy who was her aide for a decade. And no consequences for these people. People commit crimes, no consequences. The only people who suffer consequences are patriots and people on the right side of the political spectrum. We need to restore common sense and order to these countries. And it isn't going to happen with Kamala Harris, I'll tell you that much. I want to show you a video to which I think you will be able to identify with. Let me just get it up. American high school gym class looked like in the 1960s. This footage is from one of the 4,000 U.S. high schools that followed La Sierra's physical education program that was pushed to be the standard model by JFK. According to the La Sierra physical education standards that were outlined in their 1966 handbook, the minimum push-ups that a student should be able to do is 16, and they should have at least a seven and a half minute mile run. Considering most modern Americans struggle to even complete five push-ups, this 16 minimum is quite shocking. The top group that was outlined in the handbook is Blue Team, and to be a part of this, you had to be able to perform 12 handstand push-ups and at least 14 pull-ups, which are crazily impressive standards. Considering one in six modern American children have obesity, it is a shocking sight to see how seriously fitness and health were being taken in the 1960s, and how even the president was helping push forward this higher standard of physical education in school. Many people wonder if America as a country will ever return to a place even close to this. But What do you say about that, Chris? Well, I say that when I was in junior high school, this was part of physical fitness. We had physical education in school, yeah. and it was a time when the president's um, program for physical fitness was out there. He could earn a badge, and it was something we aspired to by running so many miles and such. We still did it in junior high school. But by the time I got to high school, that wasn't there. That wasn't something we did anymore. Now, I was still active because I was engaged in sports, and I was also a farmer, so I was doing a lot of physical activity. Uh, but when I came to the Army, 
Uh, I could certainly do 16 push-ups. In fact, by the time, and I, I was, I mean, my ribs were exposed. I weighed 148 pounds. I don't know what that is in kgs, but what's that, about 90 kgs maybe? <laughs> but uh, I weighed 148 pounds. About uh, 70 kgs. Yeah, 70 kgs, yeah. So that's what I weigh. And I, I wasn't as tall as I am now because I grew several inches after I came in the Army and into college. But I, I could do probably about 20 push-ups when I came in, and I'd never really focused on it since I went to high school. But by the time I finished basic training, after two months, I was doing 85 to 90 correct push-ups with my long arms, and that's a long way down. I was doing 85 to 90 of them in just two months of training. Yeah, society is rotten. Um, we, we don't do this. You know, Schwarzenegger became famous because, because of his career, but politically became famous initially because George Herbert Walker Bush appointed him as the president's, um, uh, whatever it is, the, the position for the uh, ambassador, or whatever, for physical fitness. And he tried to rejuvenate the program that was around in my youth. The country is lazy. Um, and that said, one in six kids are obese. It's got to be one in three kids, not one in six, easily, if not more. Uh, the level of obesity in South Africa, in Europe, in the United States is off the charts. It's it's shocking. But it's not just here. China's got a problem with obesity now, too. It's just it's a it's a consequence of sloth, uh, a lack of activity and diets all play a role here. So RFK is going to come into Trump's government. He's going to focus on health. We'll see what success he has. He's fighting a huge industry of multinational agricultural firms that um, that are probably going to push back against him because they want their processed food to keep continuing. But yeah, I agree with you. Um, that's that's a real problem. Physical fitness is a problem. If you're not fit, your brain's not fit. You don't sleep well, and you don't function as well as you should. And that's just the reality of things. I know that because my injured hip, which is an old army injury that came back, it really bothered me in the past year and a half has has limited my exercise and instead of walking an hour and a half every morning and an hour in the evening on top of that every single day and running a couple days a week i'm basically not doing any of that and i gained about uh six kgs as a consequence and i don't sleep as well as i used to and so i mean i didn't need that experience to know that but i'm just saying that's the personal experience i've gone through but to be fair I'm also nearly 60 years old, and I would outshine most 60-year-olds physically, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> despite that. You know, I was, uh, I, was uh, I was a gymnast at school, when I was in school, and we had to, we had to exercise uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, three days. Those three days, we had gym class, gym uh, exercise, practice, gym practice. And every session started with 100 sit-ups and 100 push-ups. That's how it started. And, I mean, if I look today at some of these youngsters that are, look, they've got a lot of fucking lip, oh man. But you look at him, and he's in his mid-20s, he's got a belly that he can't see his prick, and, uh, he wants to be the tough guy. He's Rambo. Oh, <laughs> hell. And I said to them one night, look, you, uh, my rough brickmarker, the skid marks in English, I'm not so well, but the brickmarker, I go brutal. And I call a spade a fucking bulldozer, you know, and that's the story. And I spoke to the youngster, the young men, and I said to them, what the hell? You are all talking fight, 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 fight. You can't even fucking run. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can't even chase a thief. He can't even run away from a fucking thief, man. Exactly. Well, look, in my 50s, I, I, I chased down thieves in, in, in West Africa and caught them. Purse snatchers caught them in West Africa in my 50s, you know. <laughs> no, Guys who are 18 years, 19 years old, I caught. <laughs> this was a really... A nice chat. I don't know how you experienced it. And it's not like your standard traditional chats with the guys here. But the fact of the matter is, to me, it is so important that my tribe must understand when they look at Chris Wyatt's tribe. We're from the same nation. Mm. And I've said it many times in my, uh, in my programs. The biggest mistake that you can make is if you want to use language as an identifier for a boor. That is the biggest mistake that you can make. Lang language is no role. The Afrikaners, they only have language. But they're not a nation. They're not a tribe. 
they're a fucking gang as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there has never been an Afrikaner republic. There has never been an Afrikaner war. Nothing. But there's been Boer republics. <laughs> yeah, Boer republics, Boer wars. Stella and the Boer is notorious across the globe for what he is and what he represents. But the cultural genocide that was committed against the Boer by the Afrikaners, they, sorry, I must correct that. I cannot use that word if I don't say fucking Afrikaners. Because uh, the fact of the matter is that they tried, look at me, I was 70 years old. I was sitting in front of this setup that I'm sitting here after listening to a lot of people, and I realized, fuck. I'm not an Afrikaner, I'm a Boer. And then I started exploring that. And I said, well, okay, it's fine. I've got no problem. It's in my genes. And then I was confronted with this. Okay, there was a mind shift that I had to make. But the moment that I made that shift, a lot of things became clear to me. Suddenly, I could understand why I made business decisions throughout my business life that I made. And things like that. And I started realizing, but you see, it's that bloody boor gene that does that. <laughs> and then I was confronted with this shit. I raised two boys. I raised two Afrikaners. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I started talking to them. And the youngster, the youngest one, he clicked in. Ah, it was a matter of basically one or two discussions and he was into it and he realized that's it the older one is riding the fence you know i said it many times he has opened the gate between the afrikaner and boer but he has not gone through that gate yet i went through that gate and it was a hell of a mental thing for me but i slammed the gate shut locked it and throw through the key away because that was the end of it so and that is the problem that we have in our society. There's a lot of boor young people. They have this instinctive feeling that they're a boor, but they're not so sure. A boor or Afrikaner, what am I? And, and things like that. And I think that there's not enough uh, adults that are sitting down with these guys and talking to them factually and objectively. Because to them, it has now become, they now must choose whether they want to be an Afrikaner or a Boer because they have been, they have been expropriated from their true culture. And I think you guys will see the same thing happening in America. A lot of the conservative guys, they're actually... They have got certain leanings towards the and uh, uh, the good sense of the liberal word, not the shit sense that has now yeah. been plastered onto it. And then that confuses them. But I say to the youngsters, listen, guys, that is natural and organic progression, that you will adapt certain things. But if you go back to the core, your principles, your religion is not negotiable. That is what you, and if you are fixed on that, you will immediately see the threat to your children by the system, because this system is designed to, to destroy children's minds, just to program them mm -hmm. for the system. It's about indoctrination. Yeah, and this is what I, you know, it, it bothers me a lot when I look at the Americans and I see how the hell did it happen that that brilliant mind that created all that wonderful things, that it basically evaporated. I mean, just go and look at China, look at their infrastructure. Go and look at the infrastructure in many of those Eastern countries how much money the governments are spending on roads, railways, transportation, and uh, modernizing their agricultural, modernizing their industrial base and things like that. And you look at America. I mean, we're sitting here in 2024, 
I would have suspected when I was a youngster that by now the Americans would have high-speed rail from New York to San Francisco running at three, four, five hundred miles per hour. What have you had? What you've got there was built by my generation, basically close to your parents' generation mm -hmm. and the people just behind, after us. They built that. That is there. In a great, in a big part, America is very similar to South Africa. The ANC just stopped maintaining. They stopped doing maintenance. And what was there, the infrastructure has now collapsed to such a point that it's dysfunctional. And well, I and they, the, they've, they've, they've stopped programs that would have, would have alleviated problems. For instance, the Highlands Water Project, they only finished the one that the National Party started. That finished in 95. And the other two projects were never developed. And now there's no, there's no water in Gauteng. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you see, now, and I listen to Cyril and he sits there and he tells the BRICS countries they must invest in the infrastructure of South Africa. And I look at those other BRICS members sitting there watching him while he's talking. And I try and imagine in my mind them looking at his wapping and thinking by themselves. So you mean we have to come and build railway lines that you can destroy? So you mean we have to come and build factories that you want to expropriate? Mm -hmm. One of the best things that happened, as far as I'm concerned, was when Elon Musk told Ramaphosa with his BEE shit, fuck you. Yep, that was smart. And uh, so, you know, the thing is this, uh, you must have heard of Sinner van Rensburg, and he's got all his visions and things like that. And there's a lot of talk about all the tents in the Karua and so. And I've said in my skid marks, those tents that you're seeing there, that he saw, is not the people, the South African whites fleeing from the cities to there. Those are Europeans coming for a safe landing because, uh, Chris, you're a, you're a practical guy and you understand the world and so forth a lot. You, you're not stupid when it comes to things like that. I personally believe that Europe is beyond the point of salvation. Well, I would find it hard to disagree. 25% of Ireland are foreigners, and they're in the streets demanding Sharia law and um, complaining that there are monuments to white people in Ireland. Seriously? Uh, you know, and Sweden has um, one out of seven people is a foreigner. Uh, things like gang rape was a phrase that didn't exist in the Swedish language until the mass migration they allowed to start coming in the 1960s. And Swedish girls have now been frequently gang raped, and it's become a term that's now in the Swedish language. Yeah, Europe is uh, probably, I think the breaking point, the true breaking point was Angela Merkel selling Germany down the river, allowing millions of criminal alien evaders to flood into Europe and then yeah. undermine things. You know, I mean, I, I, have, I have family in Germany. And in one village, one one uh, Dorf, or as you guys would say, Dorf, um, in one Dorf, um, there was uh, the, the Burgermeister. People were upset because their daughters are being sexually groped and assaulted in the Hallenbots, which is the indoor swimming pool for the summer or for the wintertime. The Schwimmbad is the outside when the Hallenbad is inside a hall. So it was wintertime, and these girls are being sexually assaulted in, in these schools. And we're talking about 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old girls. And the Burgermeister actually had this to say. This is a couple of years ago when this was happening with Miracle. Well, you shouldn't allow your daughters to wear sexually provocative clothing in a Hollenbot. Okay, number one, what they wear in the Hollenbot, as long as it conforms to German norms, is none of his damn business. This is Germany, not uh, Islamabad, not Karachi, not 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 Abuja. This is Germany, and people must abide, abide by those norms. Number two, a one-piece swimming suit is not sexually provocative. So this is a German mayor chastising a resident when his daughter has been sexually assaulted. And of course, we know what happened in, in Cologne during New Year's, uh, Sylvester Abend, New Year's Eve a few years back when America was there. We had over a thousand girls sexually assaulted, groped, and dozens of them raped in the streets near the cathedral in Cologne. And then the German police covered it up. And it was found out by investigative journalists who, who talked to people. And we found out that there were thousands of German women who were assaulted like this. Germany is gone. It's absolutely yeah. gone, and it's a disgrace because where do Germans go? They can't go home. Nigerians can go back to Nigeria. Ghanaians can go to Ghana. 
Pakistanis can go back to Pakistan. Uh, Mandarin speakers can go back to China. But where do Germans go? Where do the English go? There is no other England. There is no refuge. And these people have allowed these places to be utterly overrun and destroyed. And it's, it's, it's beyond heartbreaking. And, of course, you'll be called a xenophobe or racist. It's not about that. It's not about that. People are entitled to their culture. People are entitled to their lives, to their community. And it should not be overrun like Springfield, Ohio, with 19,000 Haitians in a town that had 59,000 residents before they were flooded with these people who have put a strain on services, who don't speak English for the most part, who are a burden, who are living in better accommodation than many people in Springfield because taxpayers are paying for it. This is morally bankrupt. It must stop. And that's why we need Trump back in office. And hopefully he'll live up to what he promises. He didn't last time. Hopefully he will this time. 30 million criminal alien invaders in America are one of the reasons why our prices are higher and why there's no housing, because they're occupying houses that they're not entitled to. They shouldn't be in the country. And I'm not talking about legal immigrants. I'm talking about the criminals who come into our country. Anyway, so there you have it. Listen, hey, it's, it is a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you. For a long time, people have said, hey, you guys should, you should get together with this guy. And when I looked at your channel the first time, of course, you know, I speak German, so I didn't see Brickmarker. What I saw was Briefmarker which, of course, is a postage stamp. And I'm like, why does some guy call himself postage stamp? <laughs> anyway, so so then I listened to your channel, and I realized, no, it's, it's not postage stamp. It means skid marks. <laughs> anyway. Let me tell you this, Chris. Let me, let's close off on this. Okay. In Sweden, a girl gets gang raped. Mm -hmm. The judge refused to deport those rapists mm -hmm. because... If they go back to their country with a rape charge, in their country they will be executed. Well, too bad for them. They shouldn't have raped the girl. <laughs> so they, they, he doesn't find them guilty. Same happened in Germany. Now, tying up to what you've been telling me about what happens there in, that, in the towns that you are talking about, do you understand why I say the white tents that Sinner saw in the Karua. Because you said it. The Pakistani can go back to Pakistan. The Nigerian can go back to Nigeria. Where must the Germans go? Where must the decent French go? Where must the decent Italians go? Where? Where can they go? Mm -hmm. Because Europe is going to be... Europe is gone, as far as I'm concerned. Look, the last numbers I had was 23 million. Immigrants. Now, if you look at England, I said to a guy in a discussion we had one night, I said to him, what you don't understand is those migrants are WEF soldiers. You don't understand it. Those guys are coming into your country. They're all young men, fighting fit men. Yep. Where are the women? Where's the children? There's nothing like that. It's yep. all these young men. What are they going to do there? You say they're unarmed. Each one of them has got two testicles and a dick. That is what they're going to use on your population for a start. Yep. Now I read an article where the British government is considering co-opting the immigrants into the thing that you were talking about, the militia type of thing to help control the population, and they'll put them in uniform. Well, this is already the case. I mean, if you go, you land at Heathrow. Every time I land at Heathrow, I get harassed by people of South Asian origin. Uh, now, I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm flying without a beard, clean cut, military guy in civilian clothes with a diplomatic passport, and I get pulled over every time to get questioned while everyone else passes through. I mean, I, that's just by South Asians. Why is that? That happens all the time. The police forces in the UK are full of people from uh, immigrant families, and they're the ones dictating and arresting people. Look, you look at the thousands of, of, of Muslims who protest in the streets violently and nothing is done to them. Then we have a 61-year-old Englishman who attends a rally. He goes to court. They've arrested and put him in jail. He goes to court. The judge says, I cannot convict you of any crime. You've not committed a crime. However, your presence was inciting people to your mere presence. Therefore, I've assigned you to prison for two years and eight months. He sent to prison for two years and eight months. He just committed suicide. I mean, this is unbelievable. Uh, yeah, a young 18-year-old kid holding a British flag in England, in the United Kingdom. He was sentenced to 12 months in prison for carrying a British flag. That's that's that's, that's unbelievable. And then you have these, and look, I'm not studying anti-Muslim. I lived in Muslim countries and I have many Muslim colleagues. It's nothing to do with that. 
and, and, and at the root, those two faiths, you know, come from the same origins, you know, they're not the same anyway. But the point here is that is that Muslims holding prayer on the Church of England grounds when there's thousands of mosques in the United Kingdom. Take your ass to a mosque and worship there. Don't sit there and insult the Church of England by praying on the grounds in front of the church. And they tolerate this garbage. They absolutely tol We tolerated this Palestinian bullshit in Washington, D.C., where they ripped down the American flag from Union Station and burned it and put up Palestinian flags. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was incarcerated. This shit must stop November 5th. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you can, now you have gone into the real skid marks mode mm, that that's a real that's a, that's, that's a real chris mode too i'll tell you uh yeah. known for my rants i haven't done many rants lately but this must stop it's not xenophobic it's not racist it's simply factual you cannot tolerate and have a country that functions when you allow this chaos who in their right mind would let someone go and rip down their own nation's flag and burn it and then put up another flag. That is an insurrection. That's what that yes. definition of insurrection is. They're yes. defying the governance of this nation. Right there in the heart of the nation's capital. It's insane. Anyway, um, thanks a lot for the invite. Uh, if you'd like to do yes. this again, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to have a chat again. And sure. um, I've got to scoot over to my channel and do my news program. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. It was great talking to you.